The last talk of uh, this day is by Bernardo Uribe from the Universidad de Nuevo in Colombia, and he will talk about oriented and unitary equivalent for civil services. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for the invitation. Professor Griffiths, Ernesto, Ludmir, thank you very much. So this uh, subject that I'm going to present is um, it's a very classical subject, boardism. It's one of the uh, many success stories in algebraic topology, the calculation of the boardism groups of manifolds. Uh, and I will put it uh, an extra twist, which is um, boardisms whenever there is a group acting on the manifolds. But before going there, let me just give an idea for the people that don't recall what is boardism. Um, and I will just sketch what is this boardism theory. So the idea is to, to classify or to understand when does a manifold become the boundary of another one. That's basically the basic question. So what I would like to do is uh, I would like to get the deformorphism classes of manifolds. And, uh, and what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to say that two manifolds, let's just pictorially think of M and M prime, these are closed manifolds, no, no boundary, are going to be in the same equivalence class or are going to be coordinant. Um, M and M prime are coordinant. Uh, if there exists another manifold N, of course, of one dimension more, this is all real manifolds, such that the boundary of the big one is the union of the other two. Um, I have to put here the correction that means that is the opposite orientation. Whenever I'm talking about oriented manifolds or complex manifolds, it should be the, the, or, uh, the opposite complex orientation. So the, the, the correlations I could have is that the manifolds could be oriented. So either the, this one, one possible decoration that I could put, namely all manifolds are oriented and all bordisms are oriented. Or I could put another one that is called unitary, which means that, uh, that the tangent bundle could be stabilized so that it becomes almost complex. So namely, I could add copies of the reals uh, to the tangent bundle. And until I reach a point on which I could make it almost complex. So whenever this happens, we say that the manifold is unitary, some sort of stable complex structure. So the, the two types of manifolds that I'm going to talk about are orientable or unitary, the non-orientable ones. I'm not going to talk about them because whenever there's a group action, there is complications. So then, this is the notation I'm going to use, and I'm going to put here F is going to be the decoration. F, uh, you could imagine that is oriented, uh, sorry, unoriented, oriented, or unitary, like the Lie groups, the appropriate Lie groups. And this will mean uh, F manifolds. By F manifolds, I mean uh, oriented, non oriented, unitary, um, up to of dimension n, of course up to the Borism rela relation. So what I'm going to do is I take the diffeomorphism classes of, a ma of manifolds of dimension n with respect to these structures. And then I'm going to mod out an extra relation, which is the Borism relation. And this is going to be the Borism set. At the, at the time, it's just a set. It's a set of all manifolds divided this equivalence relation. Now, um, this set could be, um, they could put all, put it all, all together, like in a graded set for the time being. Um, but then, of course, I have two operations on this set. One operation is the disjoint union. So the disjoint union of manifolds uh, becomes simply the addition on this group, now it's a group, and the Cartesian product simply becomes the product. Uh, the Cartesian product of manifolds will be the, the ring structure. So these things are graded rings. It's a graded ring. Namely, manifolds could be added. This union they could be multiplied with the Cartesian product. So this is the Bordism ring. The unitary, when you put a new, the oriented Bordism or the unoriented Bordism ring. Now, simple objects that one can, uh, just to have an idea, simple things historically, uh, you can imagine 
of the two-dimensional compact no uh, closed manifolds that are oriented. So these are Riemann surfaces, and Riemann for surfaces you can you can just fill them in, and, uh, and then that means that this group is just simply zero. There is all Riemann surfaces could be or bound, but if you take the non-oriented, this is non-oriented, then this is just Z2. You may think that it's generated by the class of RP2. And the Euler characteristic distinguishes this. So if the Euler characteristic is odd, then you know that it's, uh, it doesn't bound. When it's even, it bounds. Um, good, so, so here the Euler characteristic detects. Um, this is 19, say, 30s by Pontryagin, somehow, school coming around. And uh, there was uh, this uh, open question at the time, what are the three-dimensional closed manifolds up to Bordesen? And this is a very nice uh, result of Rochlin. And here, Boris, please correct me if I'm writing this correctly. Rochlin, is it? A, with, I don't know if it's Cage. It was a postdoc of Pontragin at the time, and he showed using handle body composition, 1940s, that all the three manifolds bound. Um, so now the, the way this was uh, being carried out was very geometrically, the calculation of these Bordism groups. Amazingly geometrically, using ideas from, say, most uh, coming from Pontragin to the, the, the stable homotopy groups of spheres or unstable homotopy groups of a sphere. Uh, but then, Came um, uh, and please correct me if I'm doing, I'm saying something historically that is incorrect. But then came Tom, and with a, an amazing construction that is called the Tom spectrum, uh, showed that these uh, groups with the decoration that I'm going to put here could be simply calculated as the stable homotopy groups of the appropriate Tom spectrum. So, may, namely, well, he Tom did it for uh, f equals O. Uh, F equals O, so the unoriented spectrum he put here, and then by calculating the homotopy groups of this spectrum, one could calculate these objects. And somehow, of course, all these ones, all these calculations on low dimensions just simply fold in because it was a calculation now that became um, homotopy groups with all the structures that one had before. Well, you can use the string roots, the string, the string or algebra, spectral sequences, all these machines on the right hand side. I mean, well, when it was on the left hand side, it was geometrically, it was constructing them. Um, good. So then this led them to show that, say, the unoriented Bordism ring is all Z2 and is generated by some classes um, of dimension. Um, Sorry, not equal to, to this. This, of course, comes from the Stingray algebra. Uh -huh. And here the dimension of xi is i. So it's generated by some explicit manifolds. In some cases, are the real projective space, and some others not. And the unitary, this is, this is Tom, I would say, directly. Correct me if not. The unitary Buddhism ring is a. Uh, polynomial algebra on some generators. Uh, one for each even degree. Um, and this is uh, Novikov and Milner. And I don't want to get into details who did what and who didn't do it, because Novikov claimed later that Milner didn't do it. No, it doesn't matter. But um, it was at uh, the time known that if you just tensor it with the Rationals with the complex number doesn't matter. Then this is a polynomial algebra generated on the re on the complex projective space. You could think that rational is generated by the complex projective space and the unitary Bordism ring. And uh, if we take the oriented Bordism ring, it, that's that one is very complicated. I don't know any description that is complete. But if you tensor with the Q then you know that we have the point tracking classes and the point tracking classes simply say that that this is generated by the c the, the degree four exactly so the cp4 cp8 cp12 etc etc these are the generators with the rational coefficients uh, 
Um, and so somehow, of course, these are nice uh, algebras, but at the same time, they're telling you geometrical information on the bodies in question. This is a uh, wall, I believe, no? Well, anyway. But the point is uh, more than what? Well, from these uh, rings, or to prove these rings are equivalent, we have uh, some, some set of complete invariants for this type of question. So the complete invariant, um, complete invariants, and perhaps you've seen these when you took some classes of algebraic topology and vector bundles. So the complete invariants are the, for the unoriented, we need the Stiefel Whitney numbers. Whitney numbers. What does it mean if you have two manifolds whose integrals on all the possible combinations of the Stiefel Whitney classes and all these integrals are equal? The two manifolds are coordinate. So it's a, it's a very nice theorem, of course, follows from this thing. Or, but it, or equivalently, it's the same somehow result. Um, although that you know that two manifolds are coordinate doesn't mean that you know what is the cobordism. That's, that's difficult to, to, to build, but uh, you know completely whether the two manifolds are coordinate or not. In the, in the unitary case or complex case, then you just calculate the churn numbers. Same idea. And whenever it's oriented, it's a theorem of wall, you need that the Stiefel Whitney numbers agree and the Pontryagin numbers agree. So you need Stiefel Whitney plus Pontryagin. Pontry, Pontryagin. So whenever you know that the Stiefel Whitney and the Pontryagin numbers agree, then you know that is that the two manifolds that are oriented have a bordism between them. So this is somehow it's a very complete picture in some sense. Namely, you know the complete invariant for this type of question. And um, although it's not somehow well advertised, this is completely useful when one uh, does algebraic topology. So so far so good. This is um, I would say 1950, perhaps 60, beginning of 60s with Novik and, and Milner, and. Um, Really early on, um, Connor and Floyd or started taking this idea to study spaces with involutions. So what can we say, what can Bordism say about spaces with involution? And uh, so they started somehow thinking of the equivalent version of the Bordism groups. Take manifolds with involutions. That's the simplest somehow start. Um, but of course, you could just, instead of just an involution, you could just simply take um, any any finite group. Um, I didn't say it, but I was just giving you the coefficients. I didn't put it, but all these uh, objects, you can also frame the manifolds on a space, no? You can always put all this boredism living on a space. So you have your space here, X, and you may just take the boredism living inside the space X, no? And if you do that, then you have the boredism groups on a space. And these Bordisms groups make you a homology theory, a generalized homology theory. Okay, so these are these are also homology theories. I was just giving you the coefficients of the homology theory. Good. So this is a, these are homology theories, generalized homology theory. Go. Move it. Very good. Now um, the idea is to bring again. So now I will fix the will be a finite group, will be fixed throughout the talk. And uh, I, could, I could ask the same question, namely, I have now a manifold with a, dog with, a, with a finite group action, and I wonder whether this manifold with this group action bounds. The same question, but whether it bounds equivalently. So um, I could define these Bordism groups the same way I put now uh, the decoration meaning that is unitary or oriented or unoriented, and I put the group, and I simply do the same construction. These are F manifolds with G action. And then I just divide by the G bordism relation. Same, same thing. The 
definition is not that complicated. You just put a G all over the place, and then the, board is, the, the definition flows. The question is, what are these groups now? How do, do they relate to the original ones? Or in the setup of uh, homotopy theory, this is a the equivariant homology theory. How does it relate to the non-equivariant one? And let me somehow try to give you an example of what are the, of how does these things. Um, this is a G spectrum because of. Uh, it is a G spectrum because it satisfies the properties of a homology theory. Therefore, there is a spectrum whose homology is this. But I don't know what it is. I, I don't have an I don't have an spectrum that I could cook up that realizes this. The Pontragon tom you can do it, but the Pontragon tom doesn't realize this because the Pontragon tom relies on transversality. All this construction relies on transversality, but the, the equivalent transversality has troubles, problems. You cannot just somehow separate things if they have fixed points. You cannot, you're, you're stuck in the fixed points. Therefore, you don't have transversality on the naive spectrum, and you need to do things to make a spectrum, but then you add negative homo, uh, homology groups on the homotopy spectrum, and here everything is positive. So there is a what Ernest is asking is what is the relation with the homotopical version, with the Tom spectrum? The, 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 the answer is that there is a relation, but they are different in this case. This is the geometrical Bordism group. Everything is geometrical. The other side is there is a homotopical one, but they're different. And it's not clear where is the relation from what. There is a map, the Tom Pontragon map, but nobody knows whether it's injective or no, nothing. Only for the cases which I'm going to announce here. So, uh, but I'm not going to talk about the spectrum because I'll do these things all geometrically. Um, I'm going to concentrate only on the cases, as I said before, only on the cases that is oriented or unitary. Again, because I don't want to uh, actions which are unoriented. It's more complicated, highly complicated, because of, it's, everything is torsion. It's very complicated. Now, um, so let me just give you an example. I'm going to tell you what is the second Bordism group oriented with a Z3 action. Yeah. So of course, if I take the C3 action away, then everything is uh, everything bound, so it's zero. So things become interesting because um, they, they have a C3 action. So let us construct um, a lattice that gives me this type of tori. This is a uh, 60 degrees. Well, it's completely twisted, so I have my torus will be here, R2, or complex if you want, if you want to, be, to make it complex, divided this lattice of points. Um, and in this torus, uh, I could put an action, a rotation action, 60 degrees rotation action, 60, 120 degrees rotation action. Uh, and this rotation leaves me three fixed points. One fixed point, one fixed point, one fixed point. And, um, and of course, defines uh, an object in this Bordism group. It's a torus divided the C3. But as uh, it has three fixed points with same somehow representation around it, you may think that three points cannot, they, they, they cannot bound the three points because you can. You want to the three points bound, or, or for a, a, a bunch of points to bound, they have to be even. From a point that is the outside, you should join it with something that is the inside. Somehow, three points cannot bound, and it's easy to show that this tori here is the generator, and it's a free generator. So it's generated on this torus, on the class of this torus. Somehow, it's a very explicit case. One can do it because it's surfaces, because it's the cyclic group. It's quite easy to cook up the example. And I just simply give it to you. This is the generator of the, of the second, um, of, the, yeah, of the equivalent Bordism group of surface. Now, as you may notice, it's nice because it's free. It's free. So far, it's free. So one question that one should think about around, all around here is, are there torsion elements in these things? But, I'll come back later with this. Um, so what I want you to notice is that um, this uh, 
object, um, equivariant with respect to oriented or unitary, there are rings, of course, the same structure, you can add them, you can multiply them. But I'm going to use the fact that this is a module over this other ring. So instead of trying to calculate this object as a ring itself, I'm going to understand it, try to understand as a module over this. Why have a module over this? Because I have some control of these algebras. These are very nice algebras. Okay, so, but I just want you to notice that I'm going, instead of just thinking of it as a ring, I'm going to consider it as a module. The point is that, um, uh, no, it's not easy to understand it, but, uh, <laughs> because again, since I'm doing everything geometrically here, if I give you generators, then I need to multiply, with, and, I, and, and everything is con somehow constructible. If I give you a manifold with an action, then I take a manifold with an action, then I cook up this other action, I need to tell you whether it bounds or not. So whenever I want to see this as a model over that, it's a highly complicated calculation. Again, it's a calculation. You give, give you generators here, multiply by these ones. What are the new relations? With some spectral sequences you could do, but, but it's, it's, it's somehow doesn't flow so easily because everything is geometrical here. So the point is that the, whenever um, I'm considering the unitary case, this was uh, heavily studied in the 60s and 70s, um, turns out that this, by explicit calculations, this module uh, became a free module over this algebra. No? for explicit cases of G, and this is whenever G is a billion. And some more case, also semi-direct program of a billion. Of two a billion. So, but this is explicit calculations, namely you just take your abelian group, you split it in cyclics, and then you calculate each part, you use spectral sequences, whatnot, but then you show that this is a free model. But, and, uh, and what does it in particular uh, implies that this is a free module? Ah, and I need to say something on even dimensional generators. Well, if this is the case, then in particular, this, there is no Z torsion. And in particular, all the odd part is zero. So for abelian groups, um, there is no odd dimensional manifold with an almost complex structure that doesn't bound. And moreover, there is no torsion part on these groups. How is this uh, shown? It's simply shown by taking the abelian groups and let me show, let me tell you how it is shown. So now where does the complication arise? The complication arise when the manifolds in some sense have no fixed points. They don't have fixed points when the actions are free. When the actions are free, then we have classifying spaces of, of these groups, and one needs to understand the boardism group of these classifying spaces. So the difficulty comes, and I'm going to put it like here, one needs to basically understand the following map. You take boardisms of dimension n plus one, you take your, say, unitary, or let me put it unitary, and I'm going to put two extra decorations. I'm going to now put Manifolds with boundary, and then, and this will tell you how the boundary can be. So, That's star plus one, yeah, exactly. I, no, 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 because in boardism you can have any dimension. I, you see, the complex one would be odd. It's just, it's just a stable question. There is a, there is a version to make it up. So then, what I'm, what I'm putting here, and I'll, and I'll explain to you. So what I'm going to put is manifolds. No, free, free, free. Sorry. I'm, I want to 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 study this the following boundary map, and I'll explain what is this. What it, this means is manifolds with boundary. These are manifolds with boundary. So this is U manifolds with boundary. I allow any isotropy group in the interior but I only allow the trivial group as isotropy group in the boundary. Uh, isotropy trivial on boundary. 
you may think that this is just this is just relative homology groups in some sense, like x, y. Or think of it this way. This is a manifold with boundary on which the action has to be free on the boundary. And one needs to understand this map. What is the map? We just take a manifold and send it to the boundary. But now the boundary has a free action. Since the action is free, you can take the quotient. And the quotient simply maps to the classifying space. And here, you may think of this, these are manifolds, although it doesn't look like this, but these are U-manifolds with free G actions. Now, this is the classifying space of free actions in some sense. And if you have a, a map from a space to here, you have a free action on the, on the cover. So the idea is to study this, this map completely in geometrical terms, which means I go and I take my cyclic groups, I calculate, in some sense, the unitary Bordism groups, and I know explicitly the generators, length spaces generates usually these elements in here, and I construct manifolds in here whose boundary is there, and I somehow kill all the torsion. So the idea to prove this theorem here, which is in the 60s, is that I need to kill all the torsion generators in here, and how do I do it? Explicitly, I construct some elements, and I kill the torsion part. So uh, delta, reaches torsion for G abelian. Namely, not everything, of course, and here is torsion because it's a module over this unitary group. But the torsion thing, you should imagine as the homology of BG. And, and, and what is shown is that the boundary for G abelian reaches the torsion. Now, um, this led some people in the 70s that because they were able to do it hand by hand, to believe that this could be done in general for any group, namely that I could go and take generators in here, and I could, I could cook up manifolds whose boundary are these elements in there. So that led some group of people that were doing Bordism to believe that this statement should be true in general, namely the equivalent Bordism groups are always a free module over the unitary Bordism ring. But this statement implies a lot of things. As I said, it implies no torsion, implies everything is even dimensional. So with that in hand, it was written in, in several somehow papers of the 70s. Um, and I somehow rescued this idea. And I just wrote it down and I said, well, let's make this into, into a conjecture. And I put it like this and I named it conjecture uh, for every G, find a G. Uh, this is a, so, this uh, unitary Bordism groups are equivalent are free modules over this very nice algebra. This is a polynomial algebra of the integers, free algebra. This is, uh, I wrote it in 19, uh, to four years ago, um, but somehow there was no way to prove it or disprove it, simply because there is no well, there are no hands on, on, on this object. So th three years ago, four years ago, a former student of Ernesto, Carlos Segovia, asked me uh, what, what could I do, uh, give me some problem, and then I told him, well, um, why don't you study the following question, why don't you study and um, whether um, there is some torsion on the surfaces, just simply the surfaces. What is this? Just, just, just look at surfaces. And if, and if no, we don't want unitary, we could just simply the same thing. Well, here is everything torsion. I don't need it. So, why don't calculating uh, the oriented Bordism groups over surfaces, which exactly means take any surface with a free action and see whether it bounds equivalently. So, and this is, this, this is what somehow I asked him to do. Well, I, please. and uh, so, uh, so take a free a surface with G action, free G action. Uh, oh, I need to put here tor, sorry, tor, tor. I just gave an example of something that is not zero, so it has to be the torsion part. Um, uh, zero. 
And uh, question, does it equivalently bound? So simple question. So I take, again, a, a surface with a free reaction, and I want to see, does it exist? Uh, does it exist a manifold, three-dimensional null, such that the boundary of M uh, equals sigma? Here is free, but here doesn't have to be free. Any action, any action whatsoever. Um, and so, the, so this Carlos, um, he started to study this problem from the point of view of um, Handle body decompositions of uh, taking the fundamental group and and moving it around with respect to the letters, something related to the, his PhD thesis with Ernesto, uh, and then he showed two years ago that uh, he calculated that for uh, well, that we knew the abelian, but for the alternating groups um, and the symmetric groups, the symmetric groups. Ah, symmetric, symmetric. For the symmetric groups, um, every free action bounds. So somehow it's, it's telling us, look, here somehow all this torsion part is zero for the alternating groups and the symmetric groups. The construction was combinatorically. Um, and later on, uh, yeah, say. I, I, mentioned, I mean, these two people, but I remember this McPherson more combinatorial, but it is conceivable. Mm -hmm. But the problem uh, could be they just combinatorial in every dimension. I think so, yes. It's, you, there's a relation between the group, the fundamental group, covers, uh, ramification, loss. I, you, you could also think of it as, uh, like in algebraic geometric terms. Well, uh, after dimension seven, then things could be crazy, but yeah. below that, but I don't know. You see, I don't know. I don't, I don't know still how to solve this problem. I only know it for surfaces. Um, and so then, um, this other collaborator of mine, Sam Perdon, came with a, with a very nice um, construction. This is 2000. 20, I believe. He was, he, he's a low-dimensional to, low topologist, and he was uh, studying ramification loci over surfaces with an action of a group, etc. cetera. Um, and then he came to realize, by after reading this paper of Carlos, that he knew how to solve the problem for groups of odd size. So, but the solution of him is, uh, in, 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 that involves the following construction that is called the Bogomolov multiplier of a group that is related to algebraic geometry. That's the only thing that I, I will leave close to algebraic geometry. So the construction is the following. So he showed that whenever G, uh, the size of the group is odd, and this is basically because he didn't want any um, platonic subgroup showing up. And he showed that, he, that the, you take this same construction here in the oriented case, uh, and then he take all possible isotropy groups, identity, you construct the map to BG, show that the co-kernel of this map is something, is the homological version of the Bogomolov multiplier. And I'll tell you what is the Bogomolov multiplier. So this BO homological of G is the quotient of the second homology, integral homology, which is dual to the Schur multiplier, divided the subgroup generated by the abelian subgroups, the classes generated by, so this M O G is simply the generated by the inductions of the homologies of the abelian subgroups. So what I what am I doing here? So I take the second homology, second homology you think of surfaces uh, with a free action, but I am killing the ones that are constructed from abelian subgroups in some sense. If, if I kill these abelian surfaces in some sense, then I get some group, and this becomes exact. So namely, it's telling me there are some surfaces with a free action 
which do not bound. And it's a simple calculation to show which are those ones. Uh, and the construction is completely geometrical. You, you suppose that it bounds, you construct this fixed loss i, this is some ramification loss i, and then one shows that the, at the end, the fixed loss i are just joined, this joining of circles, and the circles are related to the abelian groups. And, but let me just open a window here, since I just brought this Bogomolov model multiplier, because it might be of interest. Um, at this part, you algebraic journalists know more than me. But what, 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 what is this Bogomolov model multiplier? Um, the, 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 there is the Bogomolov multiplier, that is the homological one. These are the elements of the Schur multiplier of the group uh, that restricted. Um, these are the alphas that restricted to any abelian group are zero. So take the cohomology classes of G with coefficient C star, the Schur multiplier, and then only take the ones that the, the, the ones that, that matter are the ones that once uh, restricted to any abelian group is zero. There are some if there are some classes left over, this is what is called the Bogomolov multiplier. And Bogomol multiplier. Now what is the relation to algebraic geometry? Bogomolov in the 90s, he showed uh, that the, the unramified Brouwer group, unramified Brouwer group of a variety defined by a faithful representation, this is complex representation, the unramified Brouwer group is isomorphic to this Bogomolov multiplier. In the, and it's independent of the faithful representation, which in particular allowed him to show that if the Bogomolov multiplier is not trivial, then these varieties are not rational. What exactly is the relation between not being rational and not bounding? I don't know. This is something that, this is just a group that's appearing in two different places at the same time. Of course, there must be a relation. Of course, there will be something there that we don't know. Uh, so, somehow, the, again, 90s, Bogomolo multiplier, so there are uh, some group theorists that have been calculating this Bogomolo multiplier, what are the properties of this group? What can you say about it? And on the other hand, it pops up here uh, on surfaces. Um, don't know the reason. If anybody is interested, could try to see what is the reason between one and the other. Um, but I just wanted to mention it because why is it called Bogomolov? So, and this is the cohomological version of the Bogomolov multiplier. This is the homological version. It's one dual to the other. Good. So, having this, then uh, this Eric. Uh, was working with Carlos, I started working with them, and uh, we generalized this construction for any group um, last year, and we managed to show that this theorem simply works for any group in the same way, one has to do some blow-ups, so then this was generalized to us, generalized uh, by, as I said, Andres, who is in Bogota, uh, Carlos, who is in Mexico, uh, Eric, who is in I believe in Urbana Champaign and myself, to any group. And knowing which free actions bound, then, then it's somehow uh, not so complicated to show what are the Bordism groups of the surfaces. Besides fixed point data, so what I'm going to, sh to put here as a theorem is that the torsion part of the Bordism groups of surfaces or unitary um, is simply the sum over of conjugacy classes of subgroups of the Bogomolov multipliers of these associated vial groups, where these vial groups are the normalizer 
this is st standard constructions in, in equivalent homotopy theory. So, and also one could put, let me put it better, for f, and in here f equals SO or G or U. So the unitary or the oriented somehow has the same structure, and then one has a lot of somehow surfaces around which do not bound. Somehow this existence of, of the torsion destroys the conjecture because the conjecture implied that um, that old um, that, 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 that there is no torsion part and if there is no torsion part the information is detected through fixed point loci and these objects here because the actions are free they have no fixed points in some sense the fixed points are the whole surface so this part here is somehow unrelated to fixed point information is the perpendicular part of the fixed point information um, As the, this one of this, well, the smallest group on which the Bogomolov multiplier is not zero, example of a G, because most, mo, as you've seen, is for small groups of small size, um, this is always zero. Or, and if it's not a P group, if it's fixed, if, if it's uh, constructed with many primes, then then it's easy to show that it's also zero. But then you have to take a P group. So the smallest example is of the group of size two to the six. And is uh, let me just write it here on top. <laughs> so you have an idea more or less how it looks like. Maybe Hiko might like it. Um, it's just simply the cyclic loop of ordinate being acted by the quaternions group. And the action is the following. So let me just call C8 generated by one element. And let me just call Q8 generated by A comma B, whose relations are and a, b, a inverse equals b inverse. And the, the action is simply simple action. And, and that's it. So you take this action, then you get the semi-direct product. And it turns out that the Bogomolov multiplier of this group is just z2. Well, in, in this case, it's equal to the second homology. Um, uh, we, wh wh what is going on here? If one somehow massages this group, one can see what, what's going on is that uh, the, the, the group itself needs somehow a space to be constructed um, out of somehow a fundamental group. And so, this might be useful if I take the fundamental group of a Riemann surface of genus two, and I see it as generated by these four letters. Then I could see that what's going on is that I have a map from this P, this fundamental group, to this C8, Q8, by simply sending X to A, Y to C, Z to AB and uh, W to C again. And one simply by moving around the letters, one see that one needs one needs somehow an, a non-abelian fundamental group of a surface to get a map that is surjective on the group. That's that's what is going on in some sense. That you need you need a lot of room um, and then and then and then you need four pieces to, to get it. This is somehow one reason why the Bogonomolov multiplier is not trivial. What it has to do with the other construction that I just said, again, no idea how does it show up in one or the other cases. But so, so more to, to finish, then this conjecture, of course, is false. The conjecture in general is false. Um, but nevertheless, out of bad things, you can get good things. So you just restate it. Instead of a conjecture, you just state it as a classification problem, which is for which groups is the equivalent or uh, Bordism group a free module over the Bordism ring, instead of putting it the other way around. So if you put it as a classification problem, then, then of course, it relies on explicit calculations. So then one could say, when is this uh, unitary groups uh, free mod 
and as I said, G a billion and many other billion and almost a billion, but not much is known. And of course, it relies on explicit calculations. I don't know. I don't know anything about even the three-dimensional ones. I don't even know what is this. Could be zero. Not even in the oriented case. Uh, and and of course, this procedure. Of course, if we know story, this this procedure is not co somehow the correct one. No? Going by dimensions, then three, then four, then five, then of course I will never end. But uh, as far as I know, I, I have no other somehow option to do this because uh, these objects that I'm getting are it's, it's, it's similar to know the homology of every finite group, and there is no procedure to know the homology of every finite group. So since I don't know the homology of every finite group, I don't know any procedure how to calculate this out of out of uh, a machine. That, that works for any group. So these questions are still somehow open. Um, this brings interesting objects, three manifolds, which have an action and they don't bound. This is good or bad for Chern Simon's theory. You just simply use it if you if you can use it. Um, but um, but there is no other somehow option so far to do it. And as Ernesto was pointing out, of course there is the this is spectra to to somehow to, to deal with this problem, but the, the, the calculations they rely. If you, you want to know, if one sees how does these things get calculated, they rely on the fact that this is a free module, because then you can do things. But it, if it turns out that this is not a free module, then it's, it's, you're basically with not so much, because then you have to calculate all the relations and then you need to see what happens. Um, anyway, so that's what I was going to say a little early, but we are from Friday. So thank you very much for your attention. Variety. Says that this is not rational. Exactly. Do you know a basis representation or a, what that dimension is? Some, something like that. The, to, to get an idea of what is uh, the quotient if we know that it's not rational or it is yeah, If I remember correctly, this was a five dimensional representation that what you need at least five. Yeah, if it's too low the dimension, then uh, it's somewhat clear that you don't need so much elements in the fundamental group to, to somehow kill everything, but it has to be bigger than four. All, all, I haven't done it, but the calculations, it's always bigger than four, the representation of dimension four. You need somehow to have room for all these complicated things around, that the, the intertwiners. No, I haven't. I haven't put the other uh, decoration, which is the spin. I haven't. Um, but of course, this this is the the other f that matters. The the spin or the spin c or the yeah. I have not. G equals z mod two. Yes. So this. You uh, exactly. If you put a uh, unitary, and this is well. First, I put a U here. This is unitary. Uh, but if we put a, an S O, then then somehow I, I from S O I don't even I don't know what this thing is in general. I only know what is the second homology, which is what I just, which is zero. I know this one. Of course, these two are somewhat related. Yeah, of course, I could go to the unoriented, but somehow it's just Ernesto. The, the problem with the unoriented and the Z two is that it kills too much, because you take the orbifold, which is just fl flipping, no, uh, to minus one, to minus one, so everything bounds. So you then then you need to, need to restrict the Z two action, so so you do not cap everything. Um, and of course it's related, but but somehow it, 
it's easier somewhat this one that you have nice representations of. This, this thing also relies on, you take the fixed point data and you take the normal bundle and you take a representation or you take the vector bundle around it. Oriented bundles are nicer than unoriented ones. That, that's another reason why it's easier to do it with oriented ones. The, the oriented ones, um, um, the classifying spaces um, with respect to representations gives you a lot simpler information than if you have the non-oriented ones. It's not, I haven't done it. it. It looks that it's similar, but I don't really know how similar would that be. One question. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much for having me. Thank you.